Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Thank you for joining us today and welcome. This is an hour dedicated to understanding a little more about ourselves, our beliefs, and how we approach enlightenment. Indeed, an hour devoted to learning something more, not just about the world we live in, but about how, what, and why we think as we do. An hour for the truly open-minded, willing to risk some of those old ideas about who we are and what we might become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of respecting the very important role you play in making this show successful. Week in and week out, you keep us at the top, and we do sincerely appreciate it. Shelley wrote, <laughs> I can count on provocative enlightenment to surprise me every week with something stimulating. Thank you. Brian wrote, the topics discussed sure did some bumping around in people's belief closets. Whatever one's point of view is, Eldon will get you to wonder how that thought or belief got there through one provocative show topic or another. Or another. Well, I love it, Brian. And you do see through the curtain, my friend. Caroline wrote, Thank you, Eldon and team, for all you have given us with Intertalk programs and your Hay House radio show. Gaynor wrote, I used both the Guilt Free and Forgiving and Letting Go CD about five years ago with great results. The guilt to such a degree that even now, although I may feel the emotion momentarily, it releases almost involuntarily, and I am able to establish if it's simply a, a habitual response. I have a Catholic mother, she writes. And if not, move effortlessly into making amends for what I may have done in error. Well, that's excellent, Gaynor. Forgiving ourselves is a large part of forgiveness, and releasing guilt is necessary if we are to move on in our lives. Terry wrote, I am honored to listen to one of the Intertalk programs, and it is so uplifting. I'm going through a rough time, and I feel positive and extremely happy when I listen to Intertalk. It feels as if I am on cloud nine, and all of life's problems are floating out of my body. I can sense a healing effect on my body, and my overall health has improved. My old dysfunctional mindset has changed to a positive mindset. My life is changing, and the results are amazing. Keep up the good work and continue spreading the good news by giving help and hope to the helpless and hopeless. God bless. Well, thank you, Terry, for your lovely note. I would invite every one of you to think of one area in your life that you would like to improve. One area where change may have seemed just too difficult. Or one thing that you would, you know, sincerely like to achieve or accomplish. Then my challenge to you is this. Take that one thing to my website, intertalk, I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. You should all have that by now. Use the search box if necessary, or just simply use the right-hand navigation and click on CDs or, or brain entrainment or whatever technology you might find, you know, that most interests you. But, you know, search for that one item. Uh, it, it may be something like you want a better job or you want a job at all, or maybe you want to lose uh, a few pounds or you want to stop smoking, give up alcohol, be more patient or a better parent. Whatever the request, put in the search term and see if we don't just have a program to assist you. We have more than 300 titles and they range from the esoteric like remote viewing to the purely practical like my wife's favorite strategic planning and peak performance. You will find body image programs, better life programs, learning programs, meditation programs, spiritual programs, and so much more. Okay, order the program and use it for 30 days every day for one hour a day. I guarantee you money back that this will make such a tremendous difference in your life that like Terry, you too will find that inner wellspring where the real you, the real hidden power that resides within you, the energy that can make anything happen awaits for you. And once you begin tapping into that, you will absolutely realize a reservoir of strength and ability you were previously unaware of. So go for it. Do it today. That's my challenge to each and every one of you. 
Okay, back to our letters. Neil wrote, I simply loved your book, What If? But when I read the reviews, I could see some of my own reactions in some of them. It's not an easy book to digest. About midway into the book, I encountered my first real upset. I found myself ready to throw the book right at you. Do you believe that? Going to throw the book at me, right? <laughs> Continuing with the letter. One of the reviews calls your book an in-the-face encounter or something like that. And boy, is that ever true. But after thinking through the entire thought experiment again and again, I came to see how I had forged a belief that was built on insufficient information and faulty labels. Thank you for waking me up some. Well, thank you, Neil, for your thoughtful remarks, and I will use your letter to segue into today's show. For today, we shall discuss the idea of waking up, not just changing the bed that you sleep in. But first, let me thank all of you for your letters. We can't get them all on the air, but they do influence and shape our programming, and I invite you all to express your opinions by writing me at Eldon at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. Okay, now to today's show. What if the challenge of self-realization? You know, I asked my lovely bride of nearly 25 years now, just last week, if I was doing anyone a service by blowing the whistle on nonsense. For those of you who are longtime listeners to this program, you know that there have been several occasions that an author has said something on the air that wasn't factually correct or was questionable, and instead of letting it go, I brought it to everyone's attention. And, of course, there have been those so-called guru authors whose name is somehow, I guess, supposed to give us goosebumps uh, that have come on the show and touted nonsense, and I have called them on that as well. Sometimes we have found ourselves discussing moral issues with those who would teach a universal truth, such as we are all one, and yet defend the idea of cultural relativity where the men say in Afghanistan can shoot a woman unprovoked, but you can't hold them accountable because, and I quote, they were raised to think it was okay, close quote. Well, the long and the short of it goes like this. I have not used my show or written my books with an eye to winning friends, but rather to the notion of waking up. Nearly 30 years ago, I created Progressive Awareness Research, and it remains still focused today on waking up those who are ready to wake up. So back to my story, I asked Ravinder if she thought it was a service or a disservice to call a spade a spade. I mentioned a couple of specific authors who write much better fairy tales than anything else, but they call the book Science and Self-Help. My pretty bride snapped an answer off the tip of her tongue that says it all and does so with the power of sacred prose. She simply said, Waking up is not about changing the bed you sleep in. She went on to emphasize the importance behind her statement, and I'm sure she had many wonderful things to say, but my mind just froze on her quip. Waking up is not changing the bed that you sleep in. Think on that. Powerful, succinct, and so true. When I wrote What If? The Challenge of Self-Responsibility, I wanted to do through thought, experiment, through thought experiments. Um, so the process was very real and internal. What I wanted to do was invite the reader to truly examine their lives and their life's web of beliefs. For as I've said before, life beliefs are not standalone items. Every belief is attached to another, and together they make up part of the total web that is all of our beliefs. And this web can definitely entrap us, holding us hostage to beliefs that are inconsistent, dissonant, self-destructive, and so forth. Worse yet, this web can limit everything we will ever be able to experience, all the joy, all the success and all the fulfillment you may be entitled to. We acquire our beliefs in many ways. Those of you that have followed me, my writings, or this radio show know that beliefs come by way of enculturation, some as a result of our parents and peers, many through the entertainment we choose to watch and mirror, still more as a result of the direct intention to convince us, propaganda. We find propaganda everywhere. 
Arguably, propaganda exists in our religious institutions as well as with government and business. It seems nowadays that everyone has something they wish to sell us, some product or policy or platform or idea. Add to this mix the natural way in which we are wired, hardwired from the factory, so to speak, and you begin to realize an even deeper abyss when it comes to the information we believe and the honest way in which we obtain that belief. For example, in the presence of an authority, we are wired in such a way that our discriminating centers in the brain turn off, literally, virtually, shut down. When we see someone take a piece of chocolate from a plate and pass on the carrots, we are much more likely to take the chocolate ourselves even if we are on a health food diet. We often mirror the behavior of those surrounding us. When we change our clothes and hang up the suit, replacing it with our Levi jeans and casuals, our personality changes. Our apparel dictates our behavior. Our nucleus accumbens makes most of our decisions, and this happens not with a conscious mind, but in the unconscious. Indeed, recently I attended a continuing education unit, a, a seminar on the brain and habits. The facilitator was Dr. Brian King. Now, King is a rather rotund fellow who loves Krispy Kreme donuts. He shared a story with us regarding just how powerful the influence of the nucleus accumbens can be on our conscious processes, even when we're aware of how it all works. And for those of you that didn't realize that the nucleus accumbens is a significant, obviously significant area in the brain. Now, according to him, when he moved to where he currently lives, he was surprised to find that the nearest Krispy Kreme was several miles away, and he had to get on the freeway to get there. So for a very long time, two or three times a week, he would get on this particular freeway, just go to Krispy Kreme, get his donuts, and, and, and then return. Then one day he told himself he had to lose weight, so he stopped visiting Krispy Kreme. Well, a couple of months passed, and he was doing fine with his diet, and then one morning he had to take that Krispy Kreme freeway again in order to get to his morning appointment. Once on the freeway, like a conditioned animal, the first thing he recognized, he thought of, was Krispy Kreme. He could taste their donuts, his mouth watered, he was salivating in anticipation of Krispy Kreme. He told himself, no. I'm not going to go there. I will drive right by that exit. Then some part of him argued back. You could get your coffee there. You were going to get coffee after all anyway. No, he argued back. It could be too tempting. Those donuts smell too good. Then his mind spoke of how he might get only one donut. For after all, one donut wouldn't hurt anything. But then he argued back, who could just get one Krispy Kreme donut? Well, to make a long story short, he continued this argument until he realized that he had somehow automatically exited the freeway and was parking in the Krispy Kreme parking lot. Research shows us that an MRI tech can know what we will do well in advance of knowing for ourselves exactly what we will do and in some instances as much as seven seconds before we do know. In other words, the subconscious, the nucleus accumbens, is making most of our decisions. It is for exactly this reason that what we have in our subconscious, our beliefs, our predispositions, or what we have chosen, what we want, what supports our desires and purposes? Unfortunately, much of what we believe is, again, dissonant and self-destructive, even when we don't realize it. Enter the reason I wrote What If. I reasoned the best way to expose beliefs that fail us is to set up a series of thought experiments, and that is just what I did. Now, some of these thought experiments are definitely in your face, and they are designed to be so. They are also introductory examples of how to think about thinking 
So the experiments in no way represent all possibilities, my opinion, your opinion, right or wrong, but a process that is involved in thinking about thinking. As such, many who read the book have only praise for it. And some, well, they can throw it at me well before they ever finish reading it. It is controversial, it is provocative, and it is designed to be that. And it's not a book for those who believe they already have it all down, they know it all, their guru has waved his wand, and they are sainted. And what's more, they are comfortable where they are. So if you are comfortable, and you don't really want to challenge any of your own beliefs, please, let's stay friends. Do not buy or read the book, please. What would you like to add to that, Rab, before we get into the contents and the release of the paperback version of what does that mean? What if? And you conclude your introduction by saying, don't buy the book. Remain my friend. <laughs> well, that's like that, that is that is unique. That is totally unique. But, you know, you are correct. The book is incredibly provocative. It. Um, there's loads of thought experiments in it. Some of the thought experiments I think of uh, just offer delicious food for thought. You know, there are some things that you just take away and you mull over and you wonder what you would do and all of that. There are some thought experiments. I know when I was editing the book, because whenever you write a book, I will read it oh, about 10, 15 times in the process of editing and checking. And there were certain pages I marked up with red and said, no, 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 no way. But I ca carried on working on it. I worked on it and I worked on it. And you're right, it, it is, um, it doesn't try to tell you what to think. It just challenges all of the thoughts that you have. The fact is, it is so easy to get. But you know, the really interesting thing, I, 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 when you say that, you see, if you challenge somebody's thought and, and it rubs them wrong, and, and you had your own rubs, I mean, you know, I you, did. you're anchored to a belief, okay? You have this belief, it, you, you're vested in this belief, and, you know, you know this is the only right way. And then you're, you, you, you start processing this thought experiment, and as you start into it, you, it's slapping you in the face. It's challenging that belief. There is, seems to be this tendency to believe that, you know, well, I'm the bad guy because I, I set up this experiment, and, and I am challenging you, and that makes me, you know, I must believe the opposite. And, and, and that's not really the case. The case is in order to conduct a good thought experiment you have to be able to play both sides you have to be the protagonist and the antagonist and somewhere between thesis and antithesis we find synthesis i think what happens is you know some people most of us actually you know i, I can't even say some people but we all have certain beliefs that we are really really attached to and the whole purpose of your career, everything that you have done, the radio show, the provocative enlightenment is about waking people up, not just giving them a different bed to sleep in. And I love that, by the way. We you know don't. That. I, yeah, I thank you. That it sums it up. You know, progressive awareness. That's where the name came from to make people progressively aware, to wake them up to their potential, to wake them up to the truth. And the fact is, we have so many things that will trip us up and you know just our psychology the herd animal aspect of who we are it's really hard to think for ourselves but the only way to enlightenment is to think for yourself so for those people who have beliefs that they're really attached to there are some that aren't going to let those beliefs go and so they're going to blame you and say um they want to throw the book at you you see and i had some of my moments I would encourage people to persist. If you don't take it personally, um, as in an attack from Eldon to you, because that's not what it is at all. You know, if you really see it for what it is, he is playing devil's advocate in some places, but it's designed to shake you up. It's designed not to give you the answer because no one else can give you your answers. It's designed to help you find your answers for yourself. 
So it is, it can be a very difficult book to read. I think it's a crucial book to read um, if you want to discover who you, if you want to get beyond, you know, that, that that's it. I mean, I see people getting stuck. You know, they may have been brought up Catholic and they reach a point where they want to push that all aside so they're going to embrace something else. But they embrace this something else, whatever it may be, and they just get trapped in a different place. They really haven't progressed. They've still given their power away. Taken on another bed. In their desperate effort to escape, they have grabbed whatever felt comfortable or safe. And it is so easy you know, to, to hear the things that we want to hear. It is so easy to be supplicated by that warm, tender, everything is okay, you're right where you're supposed to be, life is just fuzzy and it's just wonderful. It, it, it is so easy to be taken in by that. And it's not that that's not true. It's that it's not a complete truth. There you go. It's not the whole picture. You know, it, 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 it is a wonderful fairy tale. Uh, but, you know, life happens. Real life happens. There are pains. There are agonies. There are decisions in life. You know, we're, we're not objects that just sit on a shelf like a vase and enjoy the atmosphere. We are participating. We are thinking uh, agents constantly interacting with our environment. And the nature of that is our environment's not a vacuum. So... You know, we are we are every day looking at what many of us uh, consider to be challenges. They are they are the issues that give strength to our character. They are the opportunities for us to grow and become all that we can be. But they are not soft, silky pillows. All of them, and uh, sometimes you know we can get a frame of mind. Because one of the things that I wanted to do in the book was go right at some of the so-called sacred cows. You, you're just not supposed to talk about it. You don't talk about religion. Don't talk about politics. They're just going to alienate <laughs> people. You, 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 we have had that conversation before. And all the marketing gurus, and I know this because we give marketing advice sometimes, all the marketing gurus will say, boy, you don't want to do that. Because if you do that, people will look at what you do on the basis of the challenge that you put out there, you know. And, and, and of course, again, what we really want to do is call everyone to wake up. And we're really talking about the nature of knowing and of waking up. So I want to remind you to like our Facebook fan page for Provocative Enlightenment Radio. As a fan, you will always know where we are and what's on next. I would also like to invite you to join me on Facebook while you're there. All right, let's get back to where we were, Rav. I think uh, we were talking about conversation that you and I often have. Uh, conversation really has to go something like uh, this, you know. When you question someone's belief, they can take offense. And if they take offense, then they'll walk away from your product. So you go at risk when you do that, it's not about selling a product, obviously, because the place to be would be neutral with regard to these issues. So why is it then we made the decision to go at risk and say, hold it a minute, that's not how it is, or wait, you know, have you considered this? What, what is that about? You know, that is the conversation we've had many a time, you know, um, from the marketing perspective and business matters and, you know, making a profit matters. All of that stuff is important, but it's not as important as being true to yourself. You know, we're in this business, um, not just for the sake of the business. We're in the business for our own sake as well, for our own personal growth and being true to ourselves. And for me, I want to help as many people as possible see that there is a whole lot more to life than, you know, the comfortable bed that they're choosing right now. Um, you know, that, that, that's what it comes down to. So, yeah, we don't make the best decisions. It's not the best decision for business, but I think it's the best decision for me, and I believe it's the best decision for you. You know, you have to go to bed at night 
feeling comfortable. It's not about making a profit. It's about helping people um, achieve their highest. And collectively, I think we can do a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. But it is, it, it is, it's a group effort. We're in this together. You know, there's the story about Kuan Yin. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it really appeals to me because the, the short piece that I heard indicated that she had the ability to, you know, transcend, cross over to the other side. But she heard the cries of man and she says, I'm not going to go over. I'm not going to go over there till everyone can come with me. Well, that's very much how I feel. That's how you feel as well. Our work here isn't done until we can assist everyone else. And you have to carry on shaking the mold because the more you look at, you know, the, the work that you've got in mind programming and choices and illusions, you know, there are so many obstacles that are going to come and trip us up and encourage us to join the crowd. It's so much more comfortable to be part of the crowd and to meet their approval than it is to strike out on your own and say, hang on, that that doesn't work. That's not quite right. That's not the complete picture. I want to know a whole lot more than that. You know, when I was a very small boy, I uh, I read about Sambo's tiger. And, uh, you know, I had one of these illustrated uh, children's books. And, of course, it showed Sambo running in the, in the circle. And this tiger was in hot pursuit. And, and as the tiger chased this person around and round and round, the tiger slowly melted and became butter, and Sambo served that up on his pancakes. And I was struck by the idea then, and I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, maybe I was six or seven, I wasn't very old. Uh, that's how a lot of people live their lives, you know? They go round and round and round, doing the same thing, chasing their tail, just going in this vicious circle, and... Uh, at, at best, what what can be had from that is maybe they leave something to someone that becomes their butter. Uh, when indeed all we have to do, I think, is stop long enough to look at where we are, what it is that we believe, why it is that we believe that, move some of those value norm anchor points. You know, years ago, uh, Dr. Charles McCusker and I did a piece on value norm anchor points. You know about that, but for our audience, it it has to do with, um, think of a calculus, uh, maybe like a hedonic calculus, where we have hedons of pleasure and hedons of pain, and, and they extend to, say, negative 10 and positive 10. That would be 10 hedons of of pain on the negative side and 10 hedons of pleasure on the positive side. If you think of a calculus like that, we have values that are all, that exist along this calculus. And, and these values are normative in their nature, and they're anchored there. Now, you know, Ingo Swann, when he wrote his book, Nostradamus Factor, mm-hmm. said that if you think about our our ability to do remote viewing or our ability to open up to a sixth sense. If you think about it using this uh, value norm anchor point calculus uh, of mine, it, it is because we become anchored in a given belief that stops us, prevents us from experiencing what all of us could experience, what Ingo was teaching in, in his remote viewing. Uh, there are so many areas and so many people that I've talked to in, in my lifetime who can step one more step. You, you think of it as the stairway, who can mm-hmm. step one more step up and everything in their life changes. But because they have some value, some belief that anchors them uh, to where they are, they're effectively that tiger. You know, they're just going in a circle bumping into themselves uh, time and time again. And, and it, is, it is so easy. Let me ask you this while we're, while we're on that. When you read the book, mm-hmm. uh, there were a couple of places I know <laughs> that, that really were difficult for you. Uh, do you want, I mean, do you want to, because I know when I wrote the book, as I work through some of these issues, and, and what I tried to do is just take the most controversial subjects out there, 
let's go get the most controversial, those subjects where there is so much polarization in our society that if we put that subject down and we then just start thinking about it, you know, taking it apart, looking at it from both sides of the equation, and then as a neutral observer from the outside, we could we can go through these kinds of issues. What are there, like 22 thought experiments in the book? We can go through these kinds of issues. Two things happen. We discover things about ourselves and our belief. That's for sure. But we also are learning how to think about these situations because there are far more than 22 polarizing issues in the world. But now with that said, I know that when I took on some of these issues, I had some... You know, some of my own um, growing, if you will, as I went through it. What, what challenge? What did you? What challenged you the most? What challenged me the most? That really is opening me up, isn't it? <laughs> okay. If you want to know my deep, deepest, darkest secrets, I had. There were two of them that really had me writing in red all over your papers that really chewed me up. It took me a long time, actually. It took me nine months of working through it, I think, to get a point of balance, and I continue to work on them. But there were two. There is the um, right to life and the freedom of choice. You know, that one I had great difficulty with. I'm a woman, in case you hadn't noticed. Yeah, and you don't need to go into it. I just So these were two issues that that when you went through the process, they unnerved you uh, how? I mean, and, 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 and you don't need to be specific. Because I didn't, want to, um, I didn't want to accept what you were saying, you see. So then again, I, I was guilty, just like lots of people out there, you know, in thinking that you were telling me an answer, and I didn't want your answer. I didn't like your answer. I much preferred my answer. Um, but I carried on working on it, um, and I did actually have an epiphany that came sometime after reading the book. In fact, it's talking about it now that I've realized the connection between the two. Um, and it, I was told, I get told things in some strange ways sometimes, but I was told that the answer lies in the middle. Now, you're not going to understand that until you make that your own. That really has to be... Because if you've got a strong belief in any one area, you can bet you're wrong. You know, if you're holding on to something really firm and really hard, you can bet you're wrong. And, and you the, know what? The, extreme the side other of side either. is wrong too. Yeah. The other side is wrong too. So anything that is a sacred cow to you is wrong. It's going to stop you from growing, growing spiritually. It's going to stop you from finding yourself. It's going to feed the anger, feed the pain. I'm sorry. That's just the way it goes. We actually have a question from Mod Girl as well that feeds into right, what we're talking about right now. And she says, what are your opinions about fanatics? Why are they fanatic about their beliefs? Well, that's a subject matter that it's very personal to me right now because I've been, I've had some close contact with some fanatics and I'm seeing some lives just uprooted as a result of that. So that is something that, you know, I think about a lot. And I do, ha I have my conclusions. You can, you know, tell me what you think but too. Don't, but before you go on, I don't want to arrest what you're, the mm -hmm. direction that you're going, just for definitional purposes. A fanatic is not necessarily what we tend to think of nowadays. It's not, you know, they don't have to be fanatical, Islamist, extremist, out to kill uh, anyone that's not a Muslim, right? Mm -mm. You, you can be fanatical about Cheerios. That's my absolute very favorite. Don't talk to me about any other cereal. This is the only one to buy. Or Don't. this TV show or that TV show. Right. Isn't this TV show fantastic? Everyone has to love that we have those conversations. So what a, what a fanatic is is someone that, for all intent and purposes, refuses to look at anything other 
than their own personal perspective of any given circumstance, situation, product, etc. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And then go ahead, flesh that out. And I, they are determined to convert everyone to that view as well. I think that's the right, other part right. of, of the definition. I they agree. won't listen to anything else. And if you don't agree with them, you're condemned to hell. So and, in a sense, all of us have a little fanaticism in us, don't we? don't we? We do. I mean, it really push ups. I mean, it's a political year. Okay. Ah, don't beat me up, anybody. <laughs> but hey, look, it'd be very hard to say anything about either primary candidate at this time without alienating other people. That's true. And right but, now it's going to be 50-50. And that's because it, it, it's, it's suddenly going to become fanatical. As opposed to open-minded and, and, and free discussions and, uh, and, 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 and let's look at, you know, all issues. It, it will be this, I champion this one versus you champion that one, me against you. And isn't the me against you the real problem in fanaticism? It isn't is. that what we see in places like Darfur and... Go ahead. It happens everywhere. I think it is the you against me, me against you that is the real seeds of evil. That's where it starts. That is that very kernel at the very beginning when you start seeing people um, as being separate, when you start saying my way is right and your way is wrong. Um, yeah, that, it gets scary. But for now, I mean, people get sucked into these things out of fear. To answer your question, Mod Girl, they're afraid of being alone. They have to be part of a group. They have to have power. They get their sense of esteem, their sense of being more special than everyone else because they have the right answer and that is all there is to it. And I find that all very, very sad. As I said, it's a subject matter that has been impacting me very, very personally you, you recently. Know, I, I, and you know this. I was asked uh, not long ago, what was... What's, What's the most profound book? What book? Oh, all the books that I have ever read had the greatest impact on me. And I, and I keep that book, as you know, near me, near my desk, uh, wherever I am, uh, most of the time. And the book is The Politics of Experience by R.D. Lang. And, and Lang says this, and, and it so accurately sums things up. This, this it really became a mantra for me years ago when I ran into this text in a philosophy course and university uh, and, and it stays with me to this day but he says this given the conditions of contemporary civilization how can one claim that the normal man is sane the condition of alienation of being asleep of being unconscious of being out of one's mind is the condition of the normal man society highly values its normal man it educates children to lose themselves and to become absurd and thus to become normal. Normal men have killed perhaps a hundred million of their fellow men in the last 50 years. We are not able even to think adequately about the behavior that is at the annihilating edge, but what we think is less than what we know. What we know is less than what we love. What we love is so much less than what there is. And to that precise extent, we are so much less than what we are. How do you get people to realize, Ravinder, that this condition of self-alienation, this, this underlying, undergirding uh, imprinting that has taken place in each and every one of us automates us uh, we run automatically as a result. So you change your clothes, you change your behavior. You bring up a subject and the subject has a, a tender spot in it and a defense surfaces. You find yourself uh, in a group and someone gives you an uncomfortable look and you react to it. How is it that you, what, what is it that would be necessary to communicate the possibility that exists if we all just went back to where we were when we were children and we were innocent 
And we were just being us. We, we were just being as opposed to mirroring and pretending and automating it. What would it take to do that? Would we not have to think through all of the, this morass of, of this web of all these beliefs, all these ideas that we hold in our head in order to get back to where we were before we surrounded ourselves with this web? Maybe that's the purpose of life itself, though. You know, you come in all innocent and pure and whatever, and then you experience the world, and maybe enlightenment is coming through all of that and regaining your own sense of self so that you can become a whole lot more. Reclaiming the innocence. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Now, now let me ask you this, Al. You and I, get we have these wonderful conversations, and I'm afraid right this minute, this is a totally unrehearsed, and we are having a conversation, and our listeners are, but <clears throat> tell me, what, what do outsiders, what do experts say about this book? Well, first of all, I was going to say, there's no such thing as an expert, because you're all your own expert. Yeah, I know. Um, X is a has-been, and spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> but the opinion of some of the people that I really respect, mm -hmm. okay, that's a whole different way of saying it. Michael Bernard Beckwith, um, he's the author of Spiritual Liberation, Fulfilling Your Soul's Potential. I think almost everyone's Reverend heard of Michael Beckwith. Beckwith. Yes, uh -huh. He does some amazing stuff. But he says, few are the authors who turn you inside out, who blow up your preconceived notions and cause you to become honest with yourself through and through. That's precisely what happens when you read What If. I highly recommend this book to those who are unflinching in their journey to their to the authentic self. Yeah, see, and I love that authentic self. Unflinching in your journey, the authentic self. That's got to be one of my favorites. But it's also, he recommends it to those who are unflinching in their journey. So, as Eldon yeah. said, as Eldon says, as you said, I'm getting all confused now, as you said at the beginning of the show, you know, if you want to hold on to your beliefs, then this book isn't for you. And we would much rather just have you remain as a friend. If you want to join the journey with us, and the conversations in the book are very much the conversations you and I have over the dining room table frequently, or out fishing, or driving along. These are our conversations, and we are constantly struggling with trying to find the answers, trying to find the truth, trying not to be trapped by all of those things that do trap us, Balance. all the different kinds of Balance. programming. I have a comment here from Jay-Z Knight, and, you know, Jay-Z Knight uh, channels Ramtha. Um, incredibly wise lady. She just has, you know, a great deal. We need to have her back on the show, you know. But what she says is, in a world where governments, corporations, and religious institutions compete to capture our attention and then mold our thoughts about ourselves, Eldon's keen insight into this struggle is a valuable asset for anyone desiring to rise above the fray and regain control of their own mind. The power to be confident and comfortable with oneself as an individual without blaming others brings great freedom. Well done. So I like, I like that. I do but too. We have comments, you know, from Marcy Shymoff who says, wow, this book is a real eye opener. Uh, Colette Baron Reed says that Eldon writes in a brilliant, thought provoking style, challenging and encouraging us to be fully present to our life's journey. Thomas Campbell actually relates it to the movie The Matrix, where you talk about the red yeah, pill and the blue remark. pill. Well, that sums it up. You can choose which pill do you want to take. Um, Karen Kahn says, if you're a spiritual seeker ready to stretch beyond your comfort zone and throw out everything you think you already know, then read this book. Okay, um, now, that's Dr. Karen Kahn. Listen, we've got like two minutes. Yeah. And uh, so I want you to tell everybody how they can get the book. You know, you can buy the book at any of the, the main bookstores. You can buy it from Amazon. You can buy it from Barnes and Noble. I think Amazon has it for just over $12 right yeah. now. So it's not very much. If you've already read the book, then go out to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and post a review, pretty please. Um, yes, we love reviews. Both ways. We love reviews. Uh, you know, it's nice having you as the guest. I can kind of sit back here and just kind of chat with you. So, you know, I'm going to say thank you, Ravinder, for joining us today. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you know, I, I, you heard it. The book is What If? The Challenge of Self-Realization. I urge you to get it only if you're willing to challenge your beliefs. As Ravinder and I have both said, otherwise, please just stay our friends. Well, we've come to the end of another hour of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you will join us again next week, same time, same place. And until then, remember, believing in yourself always matters. <laughs>